In this video, we'll look at quantum theory and the electron orbitals. When we first start looking at the electron orbitals, we need to first look at what the quantum numbers are. And so when we solve the Schrodinger wave equation, that gives us a set of wave functions or orbitals. And it also gives us their corresponding energy. Each of these orbitals describes a space that the electron can be in. So the orbital is kind of your most probable location of the electron in that atom. And each orbital is described by a set of quantum numbers, specifically three different quantum numbers. You can think of the quantum numbers as like the address for the electron. Each electron will have its own unique set of quantum numbers, just like you have your own unique address for your house or your apartment. And so those three quantum numbers we look at are the principal quantum number, N, the angular momentum quantum number, L, and the magnetic quantum number, M sub L. We've already kind of seen the principal quantum number before, N. Remember, that's the different energy levels we're looking at when we were examining the Bohr model. Looking a little closer at these quantum numbers, we'll first focus on the principal and the angular momentum quantum numbers. So remember for the principal one, just like I said, the quantum number N, that describes the energy level of the orbital. So that's just like your Bohr model, where we'd have our different energy levels, N equals one, N equals two, N equals three, N equals four, up to you get n equals infinity. That would be your principal quantum number. So n is any value that's a whole number greater one or greater. And now looking at a new quantum number that we haven't seen before, the angular quantum number. So the angular quantum number defines the shape of the orbital. So this tells us kind of what shape it actually looks like. And they have different values for L. They're anywhere between zero and N minus one. And so the, week, the way we can think about that, if we have an N equals one principal quantum number, our angular quantum number L equals N minus one. So for this example, L would actually equal zero. Or if we have a quantum number N equals two, L still equals N minus one. So in this case, L equals one, and then we also have zero. So it's every number from zero up to N minus one. So you can do the same thing. Let's say, let's go big and get N equals five. If we have N equals five, then you can have L equals N minus one. So that means L is going to equal four, three, two, one, zero. So L can equal any of those quantum numbers. And usually with the angular quantum number, we designate it as a letter. We don't describe it as just a number. So we designate the orbitals by their letters. So if you have a value of zero, that's what we call an S orbital. If you have a value of one, that's what we call a P orbital. A value of two gives us a D orbital. A value of three gives us an F orbital. And we can keep going on. A value of four would give us a G orbital. A value of five would give us an H orbital. And in theory, we can keep going on in perpetuity. So that means when we're looking at are different angular quantum numbers and the n equals one, we only have an s orbital because we only have one angular quantum number. But in the n equals two level, we get an s orbital and a p orbital. So the l equals one is our p orbital and the l equals zero is our s orbital. So we have two kinds of orbitals, two types of orbitals here two different shapes. And if we go up to the n equals five, kind of our extreme example here, 
the L equals four, that would be our G orbitals. L equals three, we can see that's F. Two gives us D. One gives us a P orbital. And zero gives us an S orbital. So you can only have the different shaped orbitals based on the, the principal quantum number. So except for n equals two, we only have p and s. There is no such thing as a d orbital for an n equals two level. And there's no such thing as an f orbital for n equals two level, only p and s. In order to get the d orbital, we'd have to start at the n equals three level. Because if we start at n equals three, that would give us an angular quantum of two, one, and zero. So that's where we can start our first d orbital is in the n equals three level. And we'll see the shapes of these orbitals in just a minute and what they actually start to look like. Now looking at the magnetic quantum number, our last quantum number here. So our first one, our principal tells us what level we're at. The second one, the angular tells us the shape of that orbital and the magnetic one kind of tells us its orientation in three dimensional space. And so this kind of lets us know what the orbital looks like in three dimensional space. Is it pointing on the X, Y, on the X axis, on the Y axis, on the Z axis? So if you remember from your math classes, we have our different planes here, Y, Z, and X. So how is the orbital oriented along those three planes of act, those three axes? And so again, just like we had certain angular quantum numbers allowed, we have certain magnetic quantum numbers allowed. And the M sub Ls are integers that range from a negative L to a positive L. So anywhere in between negative L to positive L is our M sub Ls, our different orientations. So let's say we start with our simple one where we had our principal number was one, which means our angular is zero. So that M sub L can only equal zero because there's no other number. So then if we look at N equals two, our angular ones were one and zero. So that means if we look at the L equals one, then I'd have M sub L is going to equal a negative one because that would be my negative L, a zero, and then a positive one. So I have three different magnetic quantum numbers for the L equals one level. So then now if we look at our L equals two, and remember L equals two, that's our D orbitals. L equals one was our P orbitals. So for our D orbitals, we have M sub L, it's going to be a negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. So we have five different, you can think we have five different types of orbitals for the D. And you can see that got written here. And so if we do this again for the L equals three, which is our F orbitals, we'd end up with seven possible F orbitals. And we can keep going on like this. And so a little bit of terminology before we continue on. Orbitals, orbitals in the same value of n are called a shell. So anything under the n equals two level, this p and this s, they're in the same shell. Different types of orbitals are what we call subshells. So the p orbital is a type of subshell. The s orbital is another type of subshell. Or if we look at our n equals three level where we have d orbitals, that's one subshell. p orbitals, that's a second subshell. And s orbitals would be a third subshell. 
This means when we're looking at our electrons, we look at first what energy level they're at, what shell they're in. Then we look at the shape of the shell, the subshell. And then we look at the orientation along our X, Y, Z axis. And with those three pieces of information, we can get a good idea of where the electron is within that atom. So now let's start looking at the shapes of these orbitals. We'll first start with our S orbitals, the simplest one. S orbitals have an L value of zero. So if they have an L value of zero, when you, we solve their wave function, they actually end up being spherical. So if we remember, this is very much like that Bohr model where we have a spherical shape for our different levels. So you have n equals one gives us a one s, n equals two gives us a two s, and n equals three gives us a three s. So this is what our shape for the value of L is. The only difference between the energy levels, the principal quantum number n, is how big each of the spheres are. So the larger the n, the larger the sphere. And looking at our graph of probability on where we can find the electron versus distance from the nucleus. So here in our n equals one level, this one's our n equals two, and our last one here is our n equals three. So in our n equals one, you can see we'll find the electron most close to the nucleus. And then basically the probability drops off. When we solve the wave function for the n equals two, we notice we'll have some probability close to the nucleus, a little bit, but not a lot. And then we have a little gap here where we don't see anything. There is no wave function. There is no probability that the electron will be found right in the middle here. And you can see the probability skyrockets when we get a little further away. And then it starts to tail off. And then looking at the n equals three, you can see there's a little probability right near the nucleus. There's a spot where there's no chance whatsoever. We have a little more probability and then another spot where there's no chance. And then most probable the electron's gonna be out here. So those spots where there is no probability and no chance for the electron, those are what we call nodes. And when we're looking at our nodes, the number of nodes equals our n, our principal quantum number, minus one. So we can see in the n equals one level, that would be one minus one. So we'd have zero nodes. In n equals two, that would be two minus one gives us one node. N equals three would be three minus one, which gives us our two nodes. And so we can see that here. And then also in the drawing here, if we do a cutout of our orbitals, kind of the line here in between each one of these, that would be a node. That's the location where we do not find the electron. And so this idea for nodes applies to all of our different types of orbitals. And we can actually see the nodes in real life. This image is a proof of theory. It's the first direct observation of an atom's electron orbital. So we can actually see the wave functions here. And so you can see when we're looking at this, the red indicates that's where the electron's most likely at. And then the darker you get, the less likely, the less likely you get an electron. And so you can see there's actually a ring here where there's almost no electron density. That would be a node. And then we have a little bit of electron density around the outside. You can even see there's another node that circles around the inside here. So this would actually be looking at what would be the 1s, a 2s, and then a 3s. Actually pretty cool, they can see the wave function. In 2013, it was the first time we were able to actually see this.
but this is an image of a hydrogen atom and its electron orbitals. You can also see it kind of looks like the Bohr model where you have those rings. But remember, you've kind of sliced that sphere in half, but you can see the rings and that's how the Bohr model works so well. And why the Bohr model actually works for a hydrogen atom. It just doesn't work for other atoms. So now looking at our p orbitals. P orbitals, when we solve their wave function, actually end up with, actually end up with two densities, one on bottom and one on top. And then right in the center where the nucleus is, there's a node. There's no chance for the electron to be right in the center. And if we remember with the p orbital, that's our L equals one. So our M sub L is going to be negative one, zero, one. So we have three possibilities, which means when we're looking at them, we have three different orientations. We have what we call a PZ, a PX, and a PY. PZ is oriented along the Z axis. PX is oriented along the X axis. And PY is oriented along the Y axis. And then when we're looking at our p orbitals, whether it's the n equals two or n equals three, n equals three would just extend a little further out. So when we're looking at our p orbitals, if we're looking at n equals two or n equals three, n equals three is just a much bigger orbital. And there'd still be a node in between the n equals two and then the n equals three. My drawing skills are not up there to actually show it, but that's what it would look like. So now if we look at the d orbitals, with our d orbitals, our value of L for d is two, which means for our different orientations, we have M sub L equals negative two, negative one, zero, one, and two. So we have five different orientations. And when the wave function is solved, most of them look like four leaf clovers, just oriented along different planes. And then our fifth one kind of looks like a p orbital with a donut. Don't ask me how they solved it, but that's how they figured it out. The most probable for the dz squared, it looks like a p orbital with a donut. Solving the wave function for these d orbitals way beyond my skills. Now looking at f orbitals, f orbitals have an L value of three, which means we have seven different orbitals in that subshell. And when we solve the wave function, you can see the higher up in the value of L we get, the more complex the wave function looks. And so you can see with the F orbitals, D orbital had four lobes, F orbital now has six or eight, depending on which one you're looking at. And then one of them still has that P orbital, but now has two donuts. And so if we're looking at all the different orbitals in the periodic table and where they're located at, we can see when we start in the beginning here with our alkali metals, that's our S orbitals. And the further down in the periodic table you go, the different rows tell you the different energy levels, the different end levels. So when you go all the way down to the bottom, N equals seven, you can see all the different energy levels inside that. And then our transition metals, that's where we find our d orbitals and where our d orbitals start at. And so you can see when we start at the top, that's our n equals three level. And then here's n equals four. You can see the node between the n equals three area and the n equals four. So that's what the different color coding shows. And the same thing with the other main group elements over here, that's where we have our p orbitals. So you can see a 2p and then a 3p. You can see it's further out from the nucleus than the 2p is. And the further down you go, you can see how the orbitals just get further out. And then finally, the lanctonides and actinides are where the f orbitals are. And same idea, you can see, this one looks the easiest. You can see here our f orbitals for our n equals four level and then our f orbitals for our n equals five level. 
And these are all the different types of orbitals we see on the periodic table. We see S, P, D, and F. And then you can kind of imagine the further down we go in the N levels, those are our larger atoms because the orbitals are so much further out from the nucleus. And so now you guys should be able to look at your orbitals, figure out their different shapes and their different orientations. So you should know how to use the principal quantum number, the angular momentum quantum number, and, and the magnetic quantum number to figure out the shape and the orientation of an orbital.